approach. Let's find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host, Nikki Lee. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about my guest. She has chosen to dedicate her journey to changing the narrative of grief. After losing her husband to a brain aneurysm, she founded the movement Loving Life After Loss and now inspires others in processing their loss by being a shining example of choosing love over falling apart. Now, doesn't that sound inspirational? I saw that, and I said, I have got to have this woman on my show. That's just, that's just all there is to it. And then I watched her TEDx talk, and oh, my goodness, I had to have her on my show. So <laughs> I am thrilled to introduce y'all to Marie Alisi. Marie, I am so happy to have you with me. Thank you so much for having me. That is so beautiful. I'm sitting here with the biggest smile on my face <laughs> listening to your introduction. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you, Nikki. I just, you know, I have, I can't even tell you how many times I've watched your TED Talk. Thank goodness it's short. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that was you who brought up all of you. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed that, you know, mm. and it just, I, I did, I just, I really, I really, it's its actually going to be on your show page so that the listeners can watch it too. Oh, thank you. But it just, I, I you know, I, I just, it, it breaks my heart when I see people that have, have lost somebody special in their life and, and they just, they get stuck in their grief, you know, mm. and I, I can't, well, I, I lost my mom back in 2009, and then right after I went through a really big medical emergency, I was mm. recovering, and as I was recovering, I was, I was getting better, and my, my grandmother that I was closest to was, was getting worse and worse and worse, mm. and it was, it was so hard for me to going to visit her mm. and having to tell her that I was improving as I was watching her get worse. It was just, yeah. it was really, really tough to do that. Mm. Um, and then um, get, she, she didn't forewarn me that, that she had written into her plans that she wanted me to get up and speak at, at her funeral. Oh, well. And um, and I was um, in really bad shape and almost almost couldn't um, walk well enough to get up there, but I, I did manage it. Um, so I, you know, it's it's, it's been it's been rough, but mm-hmm. it's the kind of thing that that I'm to the point now where when I think about them, you know, there's that that moment of sadness, but then a, a smile because some some. Happy memory comes back to me, you know, yeah, and that kind of thing. But when I see people, I know that they they can't get to that, get past that grief and get to that that smile and that happy memory kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, it just it just breaks your heart. You know, when you're like, how how do you help them have those those happy memories? come back to them and that kind of thing so mm-hmm. I was so actually actually I sent a link to for your TED talk to a couple of friends of mine and I said oh, okay, you're you're not a widow but you, you got to listen to this message just open your mind and listen to this I, I need you to hear the big message to what she's saying you know mm-hmm. um so I just I'm I'm really really happy to have you on the show tonight I really am because oh, I'm, I'm just, I you. want your message I want your message to get out there. So I had to have you on. <laughs> so so um, instead of reading the bio that you've got, I'm going to yeah. let you kind of tell them your story. Because I think it's going sure. to go, it's going to be more effective if you tell them your bio than if I tell them your bio. Yeah. 
Um, where do I start? How, how, did you get, how did you get started? <laughs> so I think that'll, that'll do it. Let's start there. How did I get started the movement, you said? Yeah. How did, how did you get started with this? So the movement actually um, had one thing that literally planted the seed for me to, to open that movement, to open the doors to the movement, and that was the book. So about four months after Rob passed away from the brain aneurysm, I decided to write down our story. I had this moment where I felt I want to share this message with the world. I wanted to share the message about Rob, about our love story and about how he passed and how I dealt with it for a couple of different reasons. There are three main reasons where I wanted to share a love legacy for Rob. I wanted the boys to have the story written down for them when they're old enough to read it. And I wanted to share a bit of hope with the world. What I didn't expect, though, was that our, and I put it on a huge quotation marks now, our little story became an Amazon number one bestseller and it ranked in the top 100 of Australia. And that blew me away. I did not expect that. And about um, a couple of months later, I actually traveled around the world with the boys to create new happy memories. And we'll talk about the, mem- the memories in a minute, but uh, to create new happy memories, to get away from all of those milestones without their dad. And I was sitting in Vienna in Austria. Uh, that's where I was originally from. And I had this moment of reminiscing. It was about seven months into Rob's passing. And I was going back on our timeline. I was thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, like it was such a, an avalanche of emotions uh, going through the, the passing, the, what we did with it, what, how we traveled around the world, the book, everything came to me. And I thought, I've got something the world needs. This is so much bigger than just us. This is so much bigger. This is so much more than just the book. And that gave me the idea to start the movement. The book ranking in the top 100, that gave me the idea to start a movement because I thought there's obviously a lot of people out there who need this message. Let's do something about this. So about nine months into Rob's passing, I opened the doors to the movement that I gave the same title like the book, which is Loving Life After Loss. And I think it's just so perfect because it is like a, a filter for who comes into the movement. It is, and it is like a way of living, you know, and it's also a call to action. And I love it. It's just so picture perfect because it really determines who comes into this movement. And I really, really love that. Well, it really, it, well, it is a great day for the movement. And you're right. Mm. It is, it is a way of living because, yeah. Well, it's basically a call to action, you know. Yeah. I mean, so you, <laughs> it it is interesting. You you didn't foresee all that when you named the book. I'm I'm pretty no. sure, but uh, it it did work out really well. <laughs> so yeah, well, it really did. I, I, it's, it's my everything now. You know, I really poured my heart and soul into this movement, and I I started creating healing journeys for people in there. I started to create. It to create healing programs, I, you know, went on to did the TEDx talk, uh, to do the TEDx talk, and, and I also wrote my second book, Happy Healing, because I wanted to share with people what happened after the book, what it had triggered about the movement, about steps to healing, some hands-on advice that people can use, and uh, and my absolute, absolute highlight of everything we're doing is our Loving Life After Loss Retreat. It is just incredible i have no words for the transformation that happens in those three and a half days when you actually sit with people in a circle and delve deep into the emotions and shift perspectives and really shift perspective to healing rather than the loss and it's just magic what happens there well you know what one of the things that i say on here a lot and and you just made the point too, mm-hmm. without knowing it, <laughs> is <laughs> is that you know I, I say that so many times that you know we so many of us have things that we need to deal with, mm. and it's it's not easy the majority of the time, you know, mm. but it's worth the effort to deal with them, and and that's oh, another yes. one of those. 
You know, it's, you know, so often people are, for various reasons, very hesitant to take on certain things that they need to face, that they need to face, they need to deal with, they need to handle, they need to to do whatever. But it's so powerful and empowering Mm. to do it. You know, and and getting to the other side of those things is it. I mean, it's it's just like climbing over something. You know, yeah. Not literally, but you're you're mentally, emotionally, in all those ways, climbing over some hurdle that's in your way, and it's it's so worth that effort. It just yeah. I I can't say that enough. And like mm-hmm. I said, I say that so many times about different topics on here you know and it just it's just so worth it you know there were things yeah. that I put off for years and years and years and like I said I, I don't I don't know if I just didn't think I wasn't worth the effort or what yeah but man it, it I'm so glad I I wouldn't go back for anything at this point I just wouldn't you know I love that you say that, Nikki, because you know it, it always pays off when you invest in yes. yourself. And I'm I'm not yes. just talking about money. I'm talking energy and love, love above all. You know, the uh, investing in yourself, loving upon yourself, healing yourself, allowing your heart to heal. It always pays off. There's always a happier and more joyful life on the other side. Yet in right. the in the world of grief. What holds people back is often that they feel guilt if they're happy. They feel like, oh my God, I'm I'm not supposed to have I'd be happy. I'm not supposed to smile. I'm not supposed to love uh, or laugh. Even you know, there is all these uh, restrictions that they feel from society only because society has never learned how to actually properly handle grief. There are so many cultures that really celebrate somebody's passing over. They celebrate the love and the life that person had. But we in the Western society, in the Western culture, we don't do that. We mourn, we fall apart, we are sad, we wear black, we turn the light off. That's exactly what we do. And we're you know, not supposed to do that. It's it's so into the timing of when, when mom got so sick, because she actually was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Yeah. And by the time they caught it, they said basically she had three months. And, mm. and they were right... Sadly, they were right on it with that. It was right about three months, and and she was gone. And Mm -hmm. that was right about the time I was getting into my coaching training, which is right Mm -hmm. when I I started to have a whole lot of realizations that had been delayed way, 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 way too long in my life. Mm -hmm. And... um, I was getting much more outspoken and standing up for myself and, and a lot of things that I wish I'd done 30 years earlier. And um, so I I was trying to figure out how I was going to get through the whole grieving process. And, um, of course, the whole family was gathered and other friends were gathered and family friends and stuff. And, of course, they were all not happy with the way I was dealing with with the whole situation, mm-hmm. and um, I, I was keeping my thoughts to myself for the first few days, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so then I, I came in one day, and they started to say what they were going to say, and, and one person in particular always thought that, that she, it was it was her place to tell me how to live my life, and I, I, just, mm-hmm. I just was not having it that day. And I walked up and I said, okay, everybody, everybody listen up. <laughs> one of my aunts is very outspoken. She's like, oh, here it comes. <laughs> oh, buckle up. <laughs> okay. I said, this is my mother, and I'm going to handle this the way I need to handle this. And you all can think whatever you want to think, and I don't care. You can judge whatever you want to. You can think whatever you want to. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to tune you all out because yeah. it's not your business. Not mm-hmm. your business. Just keep it to yourself. And if you say it out loud, 
I'm going to ignore you. Do we all understand mm. each other? Mm-hmm. And they all start to stop it. Ignoring you, and I turned around, I'm, I left. <laughs> I'm just, I, not your business, <laughs> you know, because mm. it's, yeah. it's just not. And I, I loved what I, I saw in your stuff. You said, you know, working with the clients and with a whole lot of respect for their unique journey. Mm. Yeah. I love that. You know, because each and every one of us has to deal with our grief in our way, you know. Yeah. You know, because every every single person has their own relationship with each person and has to deal with their grief and their loss in their way, you know. So Mm -hmm. I love that. I just I love how you said that. Thank you. But that's perfect. And and there truly is, you said, there's no one size fits all when it comes to loss. And there just isn't. Never, yeah. So, very yeah. good. I like that. So, okay, let's, let's start with the big question. Mm-hmm. What is so different about the way that you address grief? Let's just wow, I love this. <laughs> yes, I love this so much because, I mean, the big difference how I approach grief was that I focus on happiness. And before everybody starts to slaughter me when you're listening to this, let me explain. So Don't turn I it was, off yet. Just listen. I was, yeah, exactly. Bear with me. Um, I was lucky enough that Rob and I had this what-if conversation a couple of years prior. And obviously, his passing was super unexpected. So we didn't have this, oh, you're dying, let's prepare for that. We, we never had that. And um, I don't even want to go into comparison because there's always an up and a downside to everything. The knowing and the having to wait and not knowing how long you've got can be super torturing, but also can buy you time to talk. The not knowing, you know, takes all that torture away. The not knowing when it's going to happen, but it also kind of doesn't give you that time to prepare and have these talks that, that you wish you, you had or whatever, you know. But Rob and I were lucky that we did have the talk a couple of years prior and it was actually triggered, and that's a beautiful story, I think, in, in hindsight, uh, if you bear to wait for the happy ending. Uh, it was triggered by a fatal accident that happened on his way home from work and Rob had to take a two-hour detour because it was a sort of one road through the National Park and if it was blocked, you had like a two-hour drive around, which which is a huge inconvenience for a lot of people when you're coming home from work and, you know, your wife's waiting with dinner or whatever, your family's waiting for you. But for one family, it meant that her husband never made it home. Oh, wow. You know, it's like a huge inconvenience for a lot of families, but for one family, it meant her husband never made it home. And we found mm-hmm. out that it was a young father. His boy was only like, I can't remember if he was a half a year old or one and a half years old, but really, really little. And so left behind a very young widow with a very young child. And it really hit home for us. I remember that night, Rob and I sitting on our bed and having this conversation. Now, what would you do if something was to happen to me? And we, we told each other what we would wish for the other person. And our kids were so little at that time, you know, and I remember this conversation and we had this conversation a couple of times over the, over the years, but this I really remember. And it always ended in something like, I would want you to create the happiest life possible for you and the boys, you know, and right. that's what love is. Love just wants you to be happy. It's that right. simple. Mm-hmm. Is it easy? <clears throat> no, not at all. But is it simple? Yes, it is that simple. Love wanted to be happy. And I freaking love this man, you know. So I was, when I heard the news about Rob's passing, I had this come up in my in my heart. I want you to take the boys and create the happiest life possible. And in that very moment when I sat in my living room having to share the news with my boys, it was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Yet happiness became my North Star. It became my lighthouse in that darkness. And I didn't know how to get there, but I knew my direction. And that direction 
was life-saving for me. I knew where I was going. And in one interview I shared once um, where this gentleman asked me, you know, did you ever escape? Because his podcast was about sobriety and, uh, you know, and, and I said, yes, I escaped into happiness. I escaped from this whole darkness and heaviness into happiness. And does it mean that I never grieved? Oh, boy, not at all. I did grieve. I did grieve along the way. I did grieve in between. I did grieve uh, underneath all that happiness. I had to learn to allow happiness to re-infuse my heart. It was not a flick the switch. Oh, you know, one day my husband died, the next day I'm happy. Not at all. I had to learn to allow joy back in, into my life, into my heart, into my mind. And it felt hard at first. I remember a, a moment in, in our kitchen, actually. Um, there was this one song that I always sang to Rob, and that is Love is in the Air. I love that song. I still think of him <laughs> when I hear it. And I sang it quite frequently. You know, I always sing when I'm happy after my kids. <laughs> and, um, and I remember that moment. Um, I can't remember how many weeks or months it was after Rob passed, but I remember that moment when this song came up in my mind and I started singing and instantly my voice left me. Instantly I, deflate, I, I deflated and I felt I had no strength, no energy, no passion to sing this song. And my mind clicked in and said, you're going to sing this song, girl, and you're going to sing it with as much enthusiasm <laughs> as you possibly can. And I sang it, and I did definitely not do a good job that day, but it was such an important moment. It was such a key mm-hmm. moment in my healing journey to decide, to choose, to do, and I needed that. I needed to allow myself, even though there was tears when I sang the song and even though I would have not wanted to stay on any stage singing that song, <laughs> but I, I just am glad that I did. It was a key moment in my healing journey. It was that opening that door, even though it was a very heavy door to push it open, to allow that joy back in. And, yeah, I'm singing again now. That's all I can say. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Interesting. Well, that's like, um, it was an interesting point that you made in your talk about support groups and how they become a competition. And that was such a good point. And I've I've noticed that in a couple of uh, support groups that I'm in, that, you know, you, you tell your story and it's it's like they're and it's it's not everybody, but certain people seem to have to one up everybody, you know. Yeah. It's like yeah, you just, you share your story, and then some people feel like they have to, but theirs yeah. is worse, you know. <laughs> yeah, I I I just have to say this because I I just realized I didn't completely finish off your question. We said what's different, you know? That is the exact thing. When I said to you, I focus on happiness, and when I started the movement, I want to teach people how to do this because, as you said, when I look into other grief support groups, and I'm putting support under quotation marks here, I hardly ever find real support in there. I mean, I get it for some people who feel supported, supportive when they can just share. But the real support is missing. The I'm listening to you. I've got you. I'm, and I can show you how to shift it for you. I'm not pushing people to, to um, heal quicker than they're ready to. That's not, that's not the issue. That's not the point. That's not my uh, go-to. But what we offer in Loving Love After Loss is we hold space for people. We shower them with love and support. And when I go into other grief groups, there is that comparison battle at its finest, how I like to call it. That's how I call it in my TEDx talk. Because there is this, you know, whose husband was younger, who had more kids, who had younger kids, whose kids weren't even born yet. And that is not helping us heal. That makes it actually worse. It makes you feel like if you're one of those where your husband might have been two years older or might have been a little less tragic in the way he passed or whatever, it completely invalidates your pain. Your pain is still right. your pain. 
your story is still right. your story. You still need space to grieve and to allow it all out to to sit there and start bawling if, if if that's what you need, but also to sit there and start laughing and be okay with it without having to feel guilty. You know, there is no right. black or white, but that's exactly mm-hmm. it. It's such a perfect example because the world likes to paint grief just in black, but there's a lot of white and there's a lot of color in between as well that people tend to forget or neglect or make you feel guilty about. I mean, right now you can't see me because we're on radio, but I'm wearing bright orange today, you know. It's harmony day. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you know, life's there for the living and we are supposed to enjoy life and love life. And, yes, adversity can kick us to the curb and can just really, really throw us this curveball that is hard to catch in the moment. Yet adversity is nothing else but a redirection in life. It's not the end of your life. Right. So that is often really hard to digest because people feel like, well, what are you saying? It's like, you know, it's just, no, there is no just in adversity. I totally get that, although I just used that word for it. But I do understand the heaviness of it. I do understand the vastness of it. Yet we can use that vastness and create a new direction for us or we can use that vastness to completely disappear, disappear and drown in it. And right. I know what I want to choose. And mm-hmm. that's why one of a thousand reasons why I started loving love after loss. Because that's what I, yeah. where I want to be. Yeah, I've got a support group that, that was a huge, huge help to me for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, as well, I was I was learning a lot about a, a condition, and as long as I was learning, it was really helpful. But then mm. I, I started just I started you know sharing my story and helping people and and helping to educate them. Mm. And then I didn't realize what was was making it so that I, I felt so drained every time I was in there. Mm. But but that that's, that's what the situation was. It was it was people trying to one up each other, and, and it's just yeah. exhausting. Yeah. But <clears throat> so I almost never go in there anymore. But like I said, yeah, I didn't because realize instead of receiving until, help for your pain, your right. pain gets invalidated through that, and that's that's not right. You know, we need to. I think that the one word answer for grief is listen. Yeah. Yep. That, yep. That does help. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So now the guilt you were talking about. Yeah. How? Why are people feeling that, and how can people let go of it? Yeah. Why are people feeling that? It is because often people are left with the "I wish I had," "I wish I had said or done or not done or not said," and I was very, very lucky that I didn't have any of that when Rob passed. And I often talk about the hidden gifts in adversity. So my dad passed when I was 20. And, you know, 12 years later, Rob passed away. And it was just something that, sorry, I was actually way later than that. I completely messed up the timeline now, but it doesn't really matter for, for what I have to say here. What I learned through my dad's passing, was to never leave anything unsaid or undone when it comes to love. And that to me, that beautiful gem that I learned through my dad's passing, because I had a lot of regrets after my dad passed. I had a lot of, I wish I had said, I wish I had done, I wish I, you know, there was this, I wasn't ready. You're never ready to lose a person that is so close to you. But it can feel very differently when you live your entire life based on when I have something to say or do about love, I'm just going to say or do it. And that's what I did with Rod. We had 12 years together where we were married and happy. We just always told each other. I think there was not one single day when I, since I met Rob um, where I didn't tell him that I loved him. 
probably not in the first couple of weeks, but you know, once we started saying it, there was not one day <laughs> where I didn't say it to him because it's not out of fear, but because out of that, I'm going to burst if I don't tell you. you know, I've got so much love in my heart for you if I don't tell you all the time. you know. And he was the same. He would rave about me. He would put me on a pedestal all the time. Like I had so many workmates come up at the funeral going like, you've got no idea how often Rob would rave about you at work. I constantly heard Marie this, Marie that, and the boys. And he was such a family man. He would always talk about you with so much love in his heart and so much respect. It was so beautiful and inspiring for us. So here is the, the guilt often comes from, oh, my God, I did this and I wish I hadn't or I said this and I wish I hadn't or I wish I had told you how much I love you or I wish I had told you how sorry I am for X, Y, Z that happened. And that guilt, and here is my absolute shortcut because obviously, you know, some people go to therapy for years to work through their guilt, but here's my shortcut version. I want to recommend the book to you. It is called Dying to Be Me by Anita Mujani. And I am more than happy to share that link with you if you want to, but it is just really, please Google that book, Dying to Be Me. And there is a paragraph in there. She had a near-death experience, and obviously she lived to write the book and share her story, and she's still alive today. And there is this moment where she describes how it was on the other side, where she stood on that sort of portal how she describes it where she had to make the decision to stay there or come back to life basically and that Mm. love that unconditional love and peace and all knowing and understanding she said it really infused her it was something that can hardly be described in human words what she felt and that always gives me that peace of mind thinking once they are in that unconditional love and peace, there's nothing, and I'm going to repeat this, please listen to this, there is nothing to feel guilty for. This is just our human experience, our human projection, our human restricted way of thinking. You are allowed to let go of that. You are allowed to feel joy and love and happiness because that is what we are here for, to learn how to do that despite adversity. So that really gave me a lot of peace and comfort. And then, of course, the number one thing, because I can hear so many people listening to this now going like, so how do I just let go of this? So how do I just let go? This is a question that has been bugging me for decades until I learned how to just do that. Because when I first dealt with that, there is no just in letting go until you know how to do it and then it's easy. It really is. It becomes so easy once you get it. And to me, I'm going to share the shortest and simplest version uh, because it is always a lot more complicated um, at first, but once you peel back the layers, it really comes down to that one simple fact. And I'm going to share the analogy with the monkey because everybody can relate to that. You know how you trap a monkey with a banana? You put a banana in a tree that's got a hole in it that literally is just the size of his fist and he'll grab the banana (laughs) and he's going to be jumping and screaming and doing whatever he can, but he's not going to let go of the banana. That's how you trap a monkey because he can't comprehend that he needs to let go of the banana. He can't fit the banana through that hole. That's just the size of his fist. So that to me was my analogy. I'm trying to just let go, but I can't let go of the banana because I want that banana, you know. So I'm I'm sitting here with my hole in in the fist, uh, my fist in a hole, sorry, (laughs) and I'm screaming and jumping and, and, you know, wanting this. And then all of a sudden somebody comes and brings this gorgeous bowl full of fresh fruit of the juiciest strawberries, bananas, mangoes, papayas, you name it. You put all the fruit on there that that you want for that monkey. Do you think the monkey is going to think for a split second, how do I let go of that banana? Or is he just going to jump for that bowl of fruit? He's just going to jump for it. And he's going to sit there later on 
not that he would because he's a monkey, but he'll get the analogy going like, oh, my God, I let go of that banana and I didn't even notice. And look how simple it was because you mm-hmm. didn't think anymore. You, you shifted your focus and that is the key element here. He shifted his focus and we can all do it. If a monkey can, we can. Do you know what I mean? We can shift our focus to who we want to be in life, how we want to live our lives. And that whole judgment from people around us, you know, it's a reflection of them, not you. Just just focus on the fruit bowl. Who do you want to be in life? Who do you want to show up as? What do you want to experience? It's called a human experience. We are here to live it, to experience it, to allow it in. And joy and happiness and love certainly is part of that fruit bowl. We are here to experience all of that. It's true. So yeah. how do we protect ourselves from expectations? Expectations of others or self? Because the answer would be different. Um, from ourselves. Mm, that's a big one. I believe that we are always our own biggest critic. So we naturally, or, you know, there's definitely overachievers here. I'm certainly one of them. I'm an overachiever. I'm a recovering perfectionist. So, um, you know, how to protect myself from my own Uh, expectations is to literally go back to what I've just shared you know that who do I actually want to be who do I want to show up at as in this world and we need to simplify our lives I needed to simplify my life I needed to look at what really matters to me what is really important to me it's obviously family it's love it's you know my boys are my everything and more than ever because it's just the three of us now And what do I want to see in the world? And whatever I want to see in the world, whatever difference I want to create, I have to first become that difference. So when we have these high expectations, sometimes it literally just takes focusing back on what we actually want and simplify that because we are so so good at overcomplicating life and we don't need to do that. We're allowed to be kind to ourselves. So I think it all comes back to simplifying self-love and being kind to yourself and practicing that every single day. That's true. Mm. So can, can we protect ourselves from other people's expectations? Yes. We absolutely can, but I have to say it does take practice. And I think the, the shortcut, again, would be to know that their expectation, again, I have to repeat this, is a reflection of their world, of how they see their world and of how they would want to see things, including ourselves. Sometimes people look at us and have a certain expectation of how they would like us to be. But it's not authentic. We need to come back to our authentic selves, the one that we were when we were little, growing up, when we were kids. We don't really care about other people's judgment. We learn that along the way, unfortunately. And then when we're old enough and wise enough, we have to unlearn it again. So, you know, (laughs) it's like really coming home to self. This is the whole idea of coming home to your true essence. And standing in your true essence without caring about other people's judgment. You're still caring for people. Do you know what I mean? There's a difference for that. And understanding that the judgment is just a reflection of their world and just a reflection of where they are at in their spiritual growth. So we can either go into judgment as well and go like, ah, 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 because you haven't advanced enough yet or because you're not spiritually awake enough yet or aware enough yet you know there are a lot of spiritual people that wear that spiritual mask but still have got so much growing to do themselves so we can go into that judgment and go like ha oh, you still got so much growing to do or we can go into that space of just sending people love 
and just practicing to accept them for who they are and where they're at on their journey. And it's not easy. It takes a lot of practice, like including myself. I'm not making an exception for me at all. You know, I look at my movement at the moment uh, as we speak, there's about three and a half thousand people or a few more in there. And I have to practice that too. I sometimes come across stories where I feel judgment coming up and I catch myself when I do it. I'm like, ah, 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 ah. what are you doing, Marie? That's not very kind, you know. And the part about it is I bring it back home to self and go like, what did that bring up for me? What's the judgment? You know, what still needs to be healed in me? So rather than staying in the judgment, because we all judge, we're human beings, you know, but rather than staying in it or making it about the other person, I take it as an opportunity for something else that wants to be seen or healed within me. And I see it as a gift when that comes up. That takes a lot of practice. It does. Hmm. So is there... Now everybody's going to be all excited when I ask you this question. (laughs) Is there a shortcut to get through grief? Yes. Yes. Really? Contrary to everyone's belief that, uh, you know, so, so many people say you have to walk through it. You have to, and there's this valley, and you have to walk through the valley, and there is no shortcut. I beg to differ because I've walked that shortcut and I've walked a long way around. I've walked both parties, both paths, I should say, and I know which one I would prefer. So when I lost my dad, I definitely waded through the heaviness and the long way around. And I started therapy about a year after my dad passed and it opened a can of worms about childhood trauma that I had completely... Um, banned into my subconscious and wasn't even aware of. So I was wading through all these things and it took me uh, 10 plus years to just do that first lot of self-discovery and healing. And then when Rob passed away, I had such a different approach to it because of, and of course you can say, well, yeah, you've already done the long uh, way around and you learned a lot along the way. Yes, I have. But there are people like me, and it's not just me. There, there's hundreds and thousands of people out there uh, talking about and teaching about mindset and, and shifting your focus and shifting your um, perspective around things. And I think that, that to me is the shortcut. That already is the shortcut, the perspective shift. You can stay and stay stuck in the pain or you can shift your perspective and go like, yeah, it really freaking sucks. And here are my two magic words right now. These are my Hmm. two magic words that I love adding to when something is really deep pain or it just, let's just name it, sucks right now because it validates that right now it does suck and it does hurt, but it also tells you it is temporary. And there is this, okay, where do I want to be? And the more you ask yourself, this is the shortcut, the more you ask yourself, where do I want to be? Who do I want to be? How do I want to feel instead of this right now? The more your focus will shift to that, the more your attention will grow on love, on whatever it is that you want to attract into your life. And I'm not just talking intimate love. I'm not just talking intimate relationships. I am talking universal love. Love in general, there is so much love in this world. It's all around us. It's our universal and eternal power source. And you can plug into it at any given moment, even and in particular in your deepest grief. That's where I would recommend it the most. Yet it is scary. It is scary to allow love back in, even just in the form of friends, because you have just lost such a deep love that your brain instantly goes to fear. Well, if I allow people in there, what if I lose them, you know? So it's Mm. a constant shifting that, acknowledging that, embracing that fear and really doing that inner work, the inner child work and the shadow work. You know, there's so, so much to do and to embrace and you can embrace it or you can push it away. So 
that is the shortcut or the long way. You can embrace it or push it away. To me, embracing is really where I go these days. And yes, it took me the long way to get to the shortcut, but I have the shortcut <laughs> now and I want to share it with people. And um, yeah, I love it. Well, but see, sometimes it takes the long way around to find the shortcut, but then you get the shortcut the next time. So Yeah, exactly. You know. Absolutely. <laughs> this is actually really funny I mean, that you say that because my dad was such a, he would always talk about, oh, there's a shortcut, but then he was the long way around. And it was such a running gag in our family because it constantly happened that my dad, we went on a hike somewhere. It's like, oh, there's a shortcut. And then he was the long <laughs> way around. And it's really funny because it's such a reflection of what actually happened. Me grieving my dad was the long way around. And now, you know, the way I, I deal with grief these days is, is definitely a shortcut. And um, and I know that some people might frown upon that. And go like, but why would you go to shortcut? Why would you? You have to do this properly. Well, says who? And who says this, this is not properly? Just because I turned towards happiness a lot earlier than people would have expected it, to me... That was honoring Rob. That was honoring what he wanted for us. That was honoring what I would have wanted for him if it was the other way around. That was honoring our love, our decision, our base that we had, the love and connection that we had built, rather than drowning in the sadness. Of the right way. Exactly. <clears throat> you have a different perspective of the right way. Yes, and everybody is allowed to do it their right way. I'm not saying my exactly. way is for everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so does your service work for everybody? No. Okay. But my service works for everybody who wants to heal. Interesting. I like that. Okay. Mm. Is it for everybody who wants to heal or is ready to heal? Or both? Both. Absolutely both. This is really the only requirement that I have for people. Because sometimes people come to me and they start working with me and then I feel a resistance. And, um, and then I always say to them, you know, it is okay if you need a break. You don't have to do this. You came to me to help you. And I, I literally do ask them, do you actually want to heal? And it is not to have a go at them at all. It is such a valuable question because sometimes people then realize, it's like, oh, no. I actually just found that in a no, for whatever reason, I'm not ready to do this yet or I don't want to, or I needed to see that now to realize that I can shift that to a, you know what? Yes, I do want to heal. I just didn't realize that I was holding myself back. So okay. it is a really, really valid question to ask. Do you want to heal your grief? Because a lot of people are stuck in that belief that society teaches. You are supposed to grieve. You are supposed to be sad. You have to wear black. You have to, have to, have to. And I'm like, according to who? Who makes the rules? If I just look at Rob and my rule, go live your life and be happy, you know? That's what I would have wanted for him from the bottom of my yeah. heart. And I knew that that's what he wanted for me because bringing it back to that, because love is simple. Love just wants you to be happy. And I truly believe that that is an absolute universal statement no matter your background you no matter your beliefs your spiritual beliefs your religious background cultural background love just wants you to be happy well i know something that that i, I say especially on some of my more intense shows mm -hmm. is i let people know that if if this is something that is a concern to them and mm -hmm. it's not something that they're ready to tackle right now yeah. that the show is being archived and mm -hmm. when they are ready, come back and yeah. the information will be here for them. Yeah, you know, cause I, I know, I know very well from my personal experience, there were things that I've covered 
that mm-hmm. there were times when I needed to hear this 20, mm-hmm. 30 years ago, but I wasn't yeah. ready. I wasn't yeah. ready to do anything about it. Oh. And you know what, yeah. any any advice like that, and I'm very aware of that, and that's why I want to say this here as well, and I couldn't thank you enough, uh, Nikki, for saying that. You know, if you're not ready mm-hmm. to hear this, that's absolutely fine. There is no judgment, and please, there's also uh, no expectation from my end. I don't want to press any uh, expectation upon you that you need to do this my way. Not at all. This is my way. And a lot of people who love it come and want to work with me. And a lot of people who are not ready uh, come back later or don't come at all. You need to find your way. And if somebody would have told me what I am teaching now too early in the journey, it could have potentially really felt like a slap in the face. And I'm owning that. Because I know that for some people, this information could potentially be hurtful or too early or like not empathetic enough, you know. But I have been through all of that and I have healed that. And that's why it is possible for me today to talk about it, to deal with it and to teach it. My little line that I often bring here is we hurt we heal, we grow, we teach. We go through these cycles. We hurt, we heal, we grow, we teach. And I've been through the hurt. I've been through a lot of hurt. And I have healed through it. And I have grown through it. And that's why I love teaching it, because I want to help people through that heaviness. I absolutely come from this intention of wanting to heal people, wanting to help people heal. And I understand that when you hear things a little bit too early on your healing journey, that it may feel like a slap in the face. But I can promise you that there is only love behind my entire intention of sharing this. And, yeah, I just want to hug anyone who really needs that right now. But it's just, yeah, I hope that comes across the right way. I'm sending big, two big, big cyber hugs out to them. How about that? Yes. Big, big cyber hugs for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what, what was your biggest turning point? Um, wow, in life, in my movement, in, in what way? In, in, this, in this journey. In this very journey with Rob. Um, yeah. I think it was that moment that I shared earlier when I was sitting in Vienna and I had this epiphany that I've got something the world needs that really required a huge step up for me a and owning it, you know, the really owning the way that I have dealt with grief. And I remember that so vividly because my mentor that helped me start the group, start the movement, Uh, said to me I started it in March and in October we had this conversation and he said to me Marie I really love everything you do and I was already waiting for the but you know when you have that sandwich approach (laughs) really great but um and he said but you're still like fluffing around a bit you know you're not really stepping into the the leader that you need to be for this movement you know what are you doing why are you holding back and I I realized It was exactly what I just addressed a couple of minutes ago. There was fear that I could offend people who are not ready to hear this. And he said, but Marie, people have come into your group to hear this. You need to step up and own this. And it's interesting because that really hit home to me. And I, I really did flip the switch. And I really did step up big time after that. So much so that I had people, like even people that didn't know me in the group, reach out to me and go like wow something really shifted in your talks I love it I love seeing this and within I also have to say I had like a an an article come out in Mamma Mia which has got about four million readers here um, and and that really helped as well you know but I was part of me stepping up and stepping out in terms of starting to share my story and you know, I've, I've since been published in so many different uh, media um, you know, like be that Channel 7, Channel 9 in Australia or Mamma Mia. And 
international radio. And, and now I'm talking to you. This is just so beautiful to be able through our technology these days to reach so many people around the world. But that's me stepping up and stepping out and really stepping into the person who I uh, set out to be. It doubled the numbers in our movement within two months of that. You know, it was incredible. It really, really shifted something. And, and that's what I want for anyone, you know, to find that turning point within you that allows you to shift and there's not, not ever only one turning point. You know, that one turning point triggers that growth and then the next turning point happens and so forth. But this is, this is definitely one of the biggest ones in my journey was the moment in Vienna when I thought, wow, I've, I've got something the world needs. I need to share this. Mm. Hey, believe it or not, I got an email <clears throat> right about... 10 minutes before we got on here Mm -hmm. and there was a quote in it that said when faced with a loss it is no use trying to recover what has gone on the other hand a great space has been opened up in your life there it lies empty waiting to be filled with something new at the moment of one's loss contradictory to what contradictory as this might seem one has been given a large slice of freedom. Wow. I literally think? had goosebumps when you read this to me. <laughs> and I love, love, love that you share this because that's exactly what I talk about. So often, you know, grief language is, is a huge, huge thing that I talk about all the time. And one of them being people so often use that phrase, there'll always be a hole in my heart. And then there is this sadness and the and the deep emotion. And I don't use that language. For me, and please feel the difference when I say that, is there will always be a space in my heart for Rob. You know, and that's exactly what he just shared. It opens up a space. And that space wants to be filled. And this is not about replacing. It's filling a hole. It's not replacing with, with something, you know. I know that might mm-hmm. sound like, well, you know, potato, potato, mm-hmm. but there is a difference. There is a difference if you think about replacing. You cannot replace a person that has passed, no. but you can mm-hmm. fill a hole. You can. So you just need to think about what would you like to fill that space with, whether that's be mm-hmm. time, emotions, uh, your mental space, mindset. You can think about. This is coming back to what do I want in life? What do I want to see and who do I want to become? I, I, love I that saw that. that. And, and the timing was incredible. I could not believe. Absolutely divine that. timing. Love it. I will, I will send that to you. And, and yes, who, who, was, who said it? I, just, I had to share that. I just, that, was, mm. that was too perfect. So you perfect. want to let the listeners know how they can, how they can find you? Sure. MarieAlessi.com. So it's just super simple. My first name, my last name, you'll definitely see it in the show notes as well. Or even if you just Google my name or even just Google Loving Love After Loss, you'll find me everywhere. I've got, uh, I've got luckily, um, some great people working in the background for me, and, and it's just amazing. Please reach out to me, you know. Connect on LinkedIn, Instagram, come into our Facebook group, connect via the website. It doesn't really matter. You'll find so much on the website, the free resources, our Facebook group. You'll definitely find this interview here as well. Once Nikki shares the link with me, I'll, I'll definitely put it up. And uh, just feel free to get in touch. You know, I'm, I'm a real person. You can just book a call with me and uh, <laughs> and we sit and chat. And I'd, I'd love to get to know you. I'd love to hold space for you. All right. Sounds good. And I will, I will have the replay on my website. And I'll have mm-hmm. uh, your links and all the information and all of that. It will be on uh, lovecoachjourney.com slash uh, life after loss. Let's do that. Mm. That'll, that'll oh, be good skipping thing. to loving. I'm heartbroken now. <laughs> <laughs> the most important part. But that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll 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 put the whole thing. It'll be 
<laughs> Lo- loving life after loss. I'll put the whole thing. The I <laughs> if abbreviated. I always call L L A L because it's just so much faster. Because it is a long yeah, title. I, I get it. But yeah, I, I like alliteration too. I'll put the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I am. I'm just so glad you're here today. Oh, and and her TED talk will be there. You must, must, must go so you can see her TED talk and see what started this whole thing and got me to have her on. <laughs> so much. <thank> you. <laughs> and, and we'll have to find. She'll she'll have to come up with something else so I can have her back. Challenge well, thank you very very much for being here with me. And oh, and thank listeners. you so much for having me. All right, and listeners. I'll be with you next time on Ready for Love Radio.